Good morning, church. When when I got back to the United States, I was roughly 11 years old, 10, 11 years old, and I was what you would have called a third world kid. And so a third world kid is a kid who was an expat from the United States, but grew up in other cultures. And so my dad was in oil and I was born in Oklahoma, but we quickly moved over to Scotland. And so I came back to Dallas saying mum and football. And, uh, and it took me about six months to get my American accent back and my Scottish accent, dis- accent disappeared. We then moved to Malaysia and we spent time there. Then we moved to Australia. Then we moved back to Malaysia. Then we moved to Singapore, then Indonesia. And we bounced all over the Southeast um, uh, Pacific Islands. I grew up overseas, and so I came back with a different understanding of culture than existed in the United States. I did not understand all the rhythms of our country because every other country has its own rhythms. Culture is what we make of the world around us. That's a real basic definition. How do you understand what you see from the stoplights to the traffic signs to what you see on the news to what you see um, when people are advertising, getting you to buy stuff? How do they pull your chain to get you to do what you do? It's culture. It's why if you look at a advertisement for paper plates in the 60s, they tell you about how rigid the plate is. And nowadays, they just show you a picnic with a bunch of laughing, happy people, and you don't ever even see the plate at all. They just throw the name of the plate up at the end. Our culture sells us a bill of goods. The Bible aims to take the culture of our heart, the culture of our nation, deconstruct it down to its core, and build it up in Christ. If you don't understand that God's intent is to ruin your culture and build up his own, the Bible will always frustrate you. You will always come to the Bible frustrated that God is disagreeing with you because God intends to disagree with you and he intends to make you holy. And so this morning, I want us, before we even dive in, Judges 11 has been one of the hardest chapters I've had to study in a minute. One, because I have a daughter and I cannot imagine how this guy, Jephthah, makes it into Israel's Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. If you haven't read chapter 11, I want to take you through it. And then we are going to dive into this interesting passage. Um, A lot of times we as pastors, we will joke and say there are hard passages in the Bible we, we would rather skip. This is really one of the hard passages in the Bible you'd like to skip. But the more I've studied it, the more I realize this reveals for us something so incredibly beautiful and an incredible warning as well. One, the cross of Christ is more powerful than anything you're going to encounter in terms of sin. Amen and hallelujah. The second is, Faithful men and women can be completely corrupted by their culture and worship sinfully. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the last section of 11. I'll tell you guys the story in the first half. It's a lot of good history. And we're going to go through the whole chapter. Let's start in verse 29. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you'll give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. And the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Orer to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out from your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies." 
on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity and I and my companions. So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months and she departed. She and her companions and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. I want to read us one more passage, and then we're going to pray. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're being given a a hall of fame is what we kind of tend to call them, but it's a list of people who by faith demonstrated the righteousness of God. And so Hebrews teaches us that we're saved by faith in faith alone. And he lists off a bunch of people who by faith alone get to be saved. And when we get to the end of Hebrews 11, it says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we too can lay aside every sin and weight that clings so close. And we can press Press onward towards the prize, the salvation that is given by faith alone. And as you read that list of people, I think our natural response ought to be, why are most of these guys on this list? Especially this one. Verse 32 in Hebrews 11 says, And for what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Let's pray, and then we're going to learn a whole bunch about Jephthah and a whole bunch about ourselves. Father God, we love you so much. And this morning as we read this chapter, Lord, I remember just as I was studying it this week, I had so many questions. God, how could this happen? How could this happen inside of Israel? Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, is this of you? Is this what, How do we understand a hard passage like this, Lord? And God, one of the most beautiful things about you and your word is that it harmonizes perfectly from Genesis to Revelation. Lord, you have given us a sufficient revelation that we might understand what we are seeing and understand what you have done. And so God, I pray this morning that one, you would make us teachable, that we would be receptive to your word. Two, Lord, that you would challenge us challenge us in our convictions and in our understanding of culture. And, and lastly, Lord, would you move us towards repentance and, and conform us to the image of your son? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me give you some back story on Jephthah. Jephthah is a fascinating guy. All right. So his prologue, the, uh, the beginning of his story starts with his father. Jephthah is born of a prostitute. He's rejected by his brothers, and he starts a Robin Hood club. This is going to be Jephthah's early life. Take a look at the beginning of chapter 11. It says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was his father, was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Jephthah is described as a mighty warrior, but he's also described as the son of a prostitute. And what's fascinating to me is countless times throughout the Bible, God will choose to use people despite their social status. That all throughout the scriptures, no matter where you come from, that is irrelevant to God. His power will be worked through you despite who your dad was, who your mom was. We've seen this in so many stories. You've got Moses, who's a murderer. You've got David, who's the least of his brothers. You've got Tamar. That's a fun story. You've got Rahab, the prostitute um, who saves Israel when they're trying to walk around and come into the land of Canaan. You have all sorts of people who are consistently messing up or come from odd backgrounds that God says, I'm going to use you in a mighty way. 
Jephthah falls into that category, and his brothers run him out of the house. They say, you are the firstborn, but you're not born of mom. Therefore, we're getting rid of you. We can't help but think of Abraham and Ishmael. It kind of rings like that. And so he's driven out into the wilderness. It reminds you of Joseph and how he's driven away by his brothers. There's all sorts of echoes of things that have already happened that make Jephthah seem very biblical. He's got the themes in his life. He's an outcast. He's sent to the wilderness. He reminds us of David when David is cast away from Saul and he's running around with his mercenaries in the back country doing good for Israel. Jephthah is that kind of a guy. When you think about him, it says that he fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Worthless fellows here shouldn't be interpreted as um, miscreants. It should be interpreted as people like him. People who did not have value in society. So he doesn't have a band of robbers. He has a band of people who have been cast away. That's why I like the idea of Robin Hood and his, and his merry bros in the woods. This is kind of his deal. He's a mighty warrior who has gathered an army about him of people who have been outcasts. Jephthah has a fascinating beginning. The first thing you ought to notice outside of his heritage is that his brothers deny him something that was owed to him. The firstborn was supposed to receive an inheritance. That's part of the covenant family in Israel. They deny him his birthright and he's sent out. You're going to want to track vows through this chapter. Vows and covenants trace through the whole chapter and how Israel thinks about vows and covenants will inform where she messes up and where she does things right. So scene two, check this out. The elders are having problems with the Ammonites. The context here comes from chapter 10. In verse 17, it says, And the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. That's where our boy Jephthah is originally from. And the people of Israel came together, and they had camped at Mizpah. That's where Jephthah is currently living. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So the precursor to the precursor for scene two is that the elders need someone to fight this nation that is rising up and has inhabited their land. Israel's next door debating to come and help, but Gilead's already under Ammonite attack. And so they go and get Jephthah. It says, after time, verse 4, chapter 11, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Jephthah brings up an interesting point. He says, You rejected the covenant of my birthright. You kicked me out of the land. You disowned me. Why in the world would you come and ask me to be your leader? That seems counterintuitive, bosses. My brothers told me I was not one of you. Now you're calling me back to be one of you. Why in the world should I honor that? I kind of like the Ammonites beating up on you for what you've done. The elders respond. They say, that is why we have turned to you now. That you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. The elders are making an interesting play. They're saying, we understand your brothers were wrong. You should not have been disowned. And because you were dishonorably disowned, we want to bring you back in and make you the head of us because you are a mighty warrior. What is this really? It's the wheelings and dealings of Israel. Does Gilead care about birthright? No, they drove him away. What do they really want? They want Robin Hood and his band of merry men to come in and save the day. And so what are they going to do? They'll make another covenant, another vow, to try and right the wrong of the first wrong, to get the next right of the next wrong. It's all upside down. While this sounds like a good deal, it's not a good deal. But we understand their point. We made a mistake, come back, and instead of restoring you, we want you to be king. The question we're going to ask is this. The next thing that Jephthah says is, Jephthah said to the elders, good, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. 
And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. This is a covenant between Gilead, Jephthah, and the Lord. This is a fascinating covenant. There's a couple times in the Old Testament where you will see covenants being made in the Lord's name. They do not usually go well. Why? Because the one voice we have not heard from yet in this chapter is God's. God hasn't raised up Jephthah. Gilead's raising up Jephthah. Jephthah is raising up Jephthah. And they're using God's name as the binding glue to hold it all together. Now, here's what's fascinating. And this is how God's sovereign plan can become very, very mysterious for us. God intends to free Israel from the Ammonites. But God is not restoring Israel to her state of holiness. We understand that in chapter 10, when it says in verse 15, and the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. That's different language that we've heard in the Old Testament. The Lord becoming impatient over the misery of Israel is a sign that God is not necessarily happy with Israel. God has a plan and it's time to hit next on the DVD player. That he's moving the plan along. That he's going to use a faithful servant. But that faithful servant is not being raised up the way Moses was raised up, the way Joseph was raised up, the way David will be raised up. But he will be raised up. He's being raised up through sinful means. So Jephthah goes, they speak these words before the Lord at Mizpah. Couple contrasts, real fast, and then we will move on to Jephthah and the Ammonites. Joseph is the one guy that just kept coming to mind. There's so many parallels between this brother and Joseph, and yet they're all like foils of one another. They're all inverted. And so where Joseph is the youngest and the favorite, Jephthah is the oldest and the least favorite. Where Joseph is the youngest, and the one that's used to bring forgiveness, Jephthah is the oldest. He's cast away, and yet he's bringing about retribution. And so while there's peace in both, there's peace through different means. Where Joseph is raised up by God through suffering, Jephthah is being raised up because of his own power and strength. And he's being given control, whereas Joseph is given control by God. This is different. You'll see the same thing with David. When David, they say, why don't you just kill Saul? Why don't you go make yourself king? He says, I'm not laying a hand on the Lord's anointed. Those whom God raises up, we tend to see a pattern of holiness. With those who raise themselves up, you can guarantee there's a big stumbling block somewhere in the next several paragraphs. All right, so we're building up towards the passage we're actually supposed to be studying. Scene three Jephthah talks to the Ammonites. So essentially, the reason the Ammonites are attacking at all is a old land dispute. They're really mad. They say, when you guys came out of Egypt and you came wandering through the desert, you beat us up and you took our land and we want our land back. Um, and so we're going to fight you for it. And so Jephthah says something very godly here. It says, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and he said, what do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel on coming up from Egypt took away my land from the Arnon and the Jabbok to the Jordan. And now therefore restore it peaceably. Give me back the land or we fight. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to him, thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen and say, sent also the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they didn't enter the territory of Moab for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. And you're like, wow, dude, boundaries everywhere. There's a lot of history going on here. He's relaying to the king of the Ammonites, you've got your history a little backwards, bro. This is what actually happened. We walked here, and then we walked here, and then we walked here, and we walked here. No fighting's happened at this point. 
It says, Israel then sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Ammonites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land. We're hedged off on all sides. We cannot get to the place we need to go. Can we pass through your land? Please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Who fought who? The Ammonites picked a fight with Israel. Israel asked if they could walk through, and the Ammonites said, we don't trust you. We think you're going to try and do something nefarious on your way through. Let's fight. And the Lord God of Israel gave Sihon and all the people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites, who inhabited that country, and they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites, from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people, Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Long story short, God took your land because you would not treat Israel favorably. You have no dispute with us. Your dispute is with God. God has dispossessed you of your lands. God is the one who redrew the boundary lines in this region. It was not us. It was you and the Lord's dispute. We were simply his hand. That's a good answer. Um, and all that the Lord God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. So his claim is this. You claim we took your land. I'm telling you, God took it. And if you try and stand up against God again, the implication is God will continue to dispossess you of it. Now, are you better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, near its villages, I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Can we highlight something in our Bibles in verse 27? The Lord, the judge. God has a title, and this title needs to exist in your conscience at all times, that what is good and evil is defined by the true judge. Who gets what and where that stuff goes is determined by God and God alone. If Jephthah makes an argument that doesn't involve God's plan, it's a bad argument. If he can't look at the way the pieces were arranged and say, you attacked us when we asked to come through, you mistreated us and God dispossessed you of your land. Therefore, you don't have a claim to this land any longer. We have to understand that God is the one who judges. God is the one who raises up kings, the one who tears down kings, the one who reorganizes the chessboard at his will. And he uses his people prophetically, he uses Christ, he uses the gospel, and in the Old Testament right here, he used Israel to draw a line in the sand that could not be crossed. That is a hard principle for many people in 2023, that the Lord is the one who judges, who decides between good and evil. Let's get to our passage. That's the backstory. So Jephthah now is marching to war. There's two things we're going to look at. First, we're going to understand what is the spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament. How are we to understand the opening verses of 29 down through his vow? And then we'll try our best to understand Jephthah's antics. Um, spirit of the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. The Spirit of the Lord is different in the Old Testament, not in nature, but in its function. And so when we become believers, when God opens our eyes to the gospel, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit as new covenant Christians. Notice I didn't say New Testament. Why? Because Testament is another word for covenant. The old covenant between God and Israel revealed to us the law and the coming of the Christ. Christ, at his crucifixion, purchases a new covenant on our behalf. What gives you righteousness is no longer what you bring to the table, like a lamb 
or simply the notion of Christ in the future, but rather it is the blood of Christ, your faith in the, in the slain lamb of God and his resurrection that gives you eternal life, that gives you regeneration. And so when you put your faith in Christ, your eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit and he indwells you bodily. And so, you know, one of the popular things we'll say is Jesus came to live in my heart. A better way to say it is the Holy Spirit resides inside me, that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the presence of God is in me. I am not the presence of God, but rather the Holy Spirit is at work in my life tangibly, physically. If you were to cut me open, you would not to be able to see the difference. This is why when you stand before God, your nature will be revealed in Christ because you are sealed by his Holy Spirit. What Christ is, you become through faith. You do not become God, but you gain the nature of righteousness through his Holy Spirit. One of my favorite things when I'm discipling um, guys is to draw a line and say, hey, zero to 10, how are you doing with God today? How are you doing? Zero to 10. And usually it's like, oh, I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray enough. I'll put a four. Four seems like a safe, bad answer. I don't want to be positive. That might be prideful. I'll go four. And I tell them, uh, that's how you feel about your faith, but you are actually a 10. You're a 10. If you were to stand before God today, God would say, you are my son and you are covered in the blood of Christ. What Christ is, I see in you. That is why Jesus becomes our covering. Your standing before God is not how you feel about your walk with God. Your standing before God is 100% purchased by Christ and is given to us and sealed for us by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit empowers all sorts of amazing things in the New Testament believer. He's going to give you understanding in your Bible reading. He's going to comfort you in your affliction. He's going to help you pray when you just don't know what to say, Romans 8. He is going to walk with you. He's going to equip you. He is going to empower your ministry. He is an amazing, awesome third person of the Trinity. May he be praised. He is God. In the Old Testament, he has a similar function, but he does not indwell. That's important because the next verse says that, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. That really threw me. I had to call some professors this week because I saw a connection. I said, wait a minute. The spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. How could he make a vow that results in the death of his daughter if, he's, if the Spirit has fallen on him? How, how is that even possible? And what they helped me see by looking through the Old Testament is that's not what's going on. The Holy Spirit is not causing this vow. That's not what's happening at all. You have to see the division between 29 and verse 30. 29, then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah and 30, and then Jephthah made a vow. The Holy Spirit's doing one thing, Jephthah is going to do another. So what is the Holy Spirit's role in the Old Testament? It is to equip, empower, and move people to carry them, to reveal, to empower God's purpose to completion. And so Jephthah is being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what? Go defeat the Ammonites. How do we know that's the emphasis of Jephthah's faith? Because Hebrews told us that. This is why he's in the Hall of Fame. It's not because of what he's about to do with his vow, but because of what he is currently doing, that by faith, he's going to go and fight the Ammonites. And so just so we can review, and you don't think I'm making that up because I've already forgotten what I read earlier. He says, what more shall I say? For time would fell me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets. What do Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David have in common? They were men of war. David, a man after God's own heart, is not allowed to build the temple because his hands are covered in blood. He's a man of war. He's a warrior poet, but he's a man of war. Barak, warrior. Gideon, warrior. Samson, a bar warrior. I'm not sure. Really strong, messed up guy, but they were all warriors who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises. Stop the mouths of lion, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. By faith, Jephthah is going to defeat the Ammonites. And to that we say, amen. That's awesome. God is using the son of a prostitute who is an outcast to become an incast to go and defeat a nation that is trying to unjustly oppress Israel. 
He's standing for justice. He's doing those things by faith. And that is what the spirit of the Lord is falling upon Jethba to bring about. Now, let's talk about Jethba. First, Jephthah's vow reveals how weak his faith is. Jephthah's vow reveals how weak his faith is. Jephthah is not a man of strong faith. Jephthah is a man of incredibly weak faith. It says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites... I shall offer it up for a burnt offering. It will belong to the Lord. Why does Jephthah do that? Why does he make this vow? The Spirit of the Lord has already fallen upon him. A couple of views. One, he doesn't know the Spirit of the Lord has fallen on him. And so he's what? He's trying to bargain with God. I, I don't know if I believe that. I think he probably knows that he stands in the will of God. That's why the text makes it apparent that the Spirit has fallen upon him as he goes. What I think we're seeing here is the true colors of Jephthah. And that is this. I think I need to offer God something other than God's own glory. I think God may want something from me other than just simply stating his name is enough. Because remember, his answer to the Ammonites, spot on. Your argument is not with us, good sirs. It is with God. God dispossessed you. It's God who you have an issue with. Take it up with him. God, I'm about to go fight this fight for you. And uh, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it's the right thing to do, but I've got a lot of cool stuff back in my house. Would you like any of that? Just in case, you know, maybe you aren't up for that. Maybe you've got another battle plan where I'm not the victor and someone else the victory. Would you like something from He is totally hedging his bets by bargaining with the Lord. There's nothing in the Old Testament law that would tell you you need to go and barter with God so that he will give you the victory. Nothing at all. In fact, a great counter to this would be when young David rolls up into an Israelite camp and a big Philistine, one guy, not an army, is raging against Israel and he goes, who is this dog? Who is this guy who's going to talk about God this way? And they're like, oh, dude, no one's going out to fight this. He's like, he's talking about God. I just have to go in the name of God and God will write his own name. Why, how could you possibly be afraid of this person when the person he's contending with is not us, but with God? And David doesn't say, hey, you can have one of the sheep when we get back. He just goes, drops the armor, takes the sling, giant falls. That is what faith based upon God's glory and his name looks like. Jephthah's faith says, I really want to live and I really want to give you something to make sure that happens. Where would he get that idea? Because he didn't get it from God's word. Jephthah is going to become a case study in what happens when culture invades worship. Because if you remember, we, we've got several chapters in the Judges now. Uh, everyone in Israel did what was right in their own eyes. Let me repeat that. Everyone. Everyone's worshiping idols. Everyone's going the way of the nations. Everyone is smudging Yahweh's name. Everyone is trying to barter with God. Everyone is saying, man, we really ought to worship those Baals just in case the crops don't come in. Everyone says, we better go worship the Asherahs just in case we don't have our children. Uh, we better offer sacrifice here. We better hedge our bets because there are powerful nations around us. And those powerful nations are claiming that they have powerful gods. So let's hedge our bets by doing what they're doing but we'll keep Yahweh right here. That's a good Yahweh. You stay there. We'll come and get you when things get too bad, when things get too hard. But here's the deal. In, in church, we got to understand this. If you live your life according to the culture that you're raised in and not according to God's word, when things get hard and you go running to God, you're going to run to him with the glasses of your culture still plastered on your face. You will not come to him as a blank slate. You will not come to him teachable. You will come to him as one who wants something. And when you want something, you will begin to what? You will barter. Church, the Lord saved me out of alcoholism a long time ago, but I will never forget some of the prayers I prayed kneeling over a toilet. 
Lord, if you just get me through tonight, I swear, I'll, I'll never sin again. Just please let me wake up in the morning. We call them 911 prayers in AA. Um, you're throwing out a line to the Lord just praying that you survive the night. I can't even imagine the things I promised God in my drunken stupor. So many different things. But think about your own lives. Have you ever thought to yourself, Lord, if you'll just give me this job, if you'll just give me this job, Lord, I swear I'll start going to men's ministry. I swear I'll do it. And uh, Lord, if you'll just, if you'll give us our, our kids, if you'll give us this school, if you'll give us this next move, if you'll give us, if you'll give me this, I promise I will do something for you. We are a nation built upon bartering with the Lord. God, if you'll just give us our nation back, the way it was, not, not the way you're going to create it to be, but as it was, that the thing I remember, if I can have that thing back, Lord, then I'll do A, B, and C. And let me tell you something. We can do those things with the absolute best of intentions. I'm going to give Jephthah some real grace here, all right? Just because I hope I would be given the same grace. He doesn't say, when I get home, I will child sacrifice for you, Lord. That's not what he says. He says, whoever walks out of those doors, I will offer up to you. The question is, why is it a whoever, not a whatever? Amen. Where does that come from? Because that didn't come from the Levitical law. That's not coming from God. That's coming from a very twisted view of worship. And that twisted view of worship is built into the corruption in Israel. He's offering God something that God doesn't want. He's offering God a bargaining chip. Church, God doesn't initiate this vow. This is Jephthah. When worship is tainted by satanic culture, sinful sacrifice will most certainly follow. When the culture taints your worship, sinful sacrifice will follow. I was reading the comment section on a Facebook this week, which is always a mistake. But it was a section talking about children and faith. And one of the things they, someone said was, you can't say what you're saying because children need to make a choice for themselves. Even if you're a Christian, you should leave your child unhindered. Let them come to the conclusions that you came to when you were a kid. I'm like, that is the most sinful response I could ever imagine a Christian saying. Son, I have access to the Father, full access to the Father through faith, and I'm not going to tell you about him. I'm not going to tell you who to follow because I'm afraid of impeding your little autonomous heart, your little sinful, autonomous, beautiful heart that needs to be invaded by Christ. I will leave Christ out of the equation until you're old enough to really hurt I could not imagine a more wretched way of thinking about parenting than saying, I'm not going to impress Christ onto my children. I'm not going to make them come to church the way I make them eat their vegetables because I want them healthy and good. And how amazing when they realize Christ isn't a carrot, he's a Wagyu steak. <laughs> we think teaching kids morality is antithetical to the gospel, and that's not true. In the same way, the law is not antithetical to the gospel. When we set a moral standard for our children and we point to Christ as their savior, the one whom they seek for forgiveness, when they wrong me and I say, son, you sin against me, but it's not me who you're really sinning against, it's against God. You've been commanded to obey me, and so I'm not sorry because you hurt my feelings. I'm sorry because I know I want you to be right with the Lord. Let me point you to his word today. As a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, we're called by parents to invade our children's hearts with the gospel, not to leave them alone. Our culture is redefining and permitting the grossest sexual sin in a millennia. I wonder if we spend more time podcasting and YouTubing than we do reading the Bible. And if as a culture, we are so shaped by the views and visions of people who don't know Christ. And these are people I'd probably hang out with, people I'd probably roll with, people I'd probably want to play sports with, hang out with, but they're not supposed to be my mentors. These are men with good ideas that don't have Jesus. And when good men 
who don't have Jesus in their good ideas take up too much of your time, you'll start chasing good ideas without Jesus. Even if you want him to be there. And that doesn't mean you can't learn. There's a, there's a common grace where we can learn and we can see just patterns that God has laid out. Sometimes things are true. They're just true. You don't, you don't need a Bible verse to validate their validity because they are true. They're true because God made them that way. We observe them as true. But beware truth that separates a relationship with Jesus from that truth. We have got a culture that is constantly pressing the church to change the way she teaches and worships. The last one that just hit me over this last week was, and this, this might be more of a testimony to my own YouTube algorithm, is uh, I kept seeing that, uh, what is it, uh, the, the zebra from Madagascar shot back at the Fresh Prince. And, uh, and so there's a comedy special, apparently, where Chris Rock took a stab back at Will Smith, and I watched it. And I didn't get to the part about Will Smith, although the clip I saw on YouTube was funny enough. I, I had to turn it off because Chris Rock might be the most disgusting comedian I've ever listened to. I want to... This, guys, when you live your lives by YouTube quotes, because that YouTube quote was so cool, I'm like, yeah, free speech, here we go. And as I listen to this, man, this was a direct quote. No one has paid for more abortions than I have. I know it's a baby because I've called the doctor to make sure the deed is done. He says, I've got daughters, and so I'm a little pro-life. But I've also got daughters, so I'm a little pro-choice. Ladies, it's a baby, and I know it's a baby. And we should have the right to kill babies. And I just turn it off. I go, now that was slap worthy. I don't want a pagan hero. I want Jesus. Because pagan heroes will taint the way we worship. It says, and Jephthah came to his home. He struck down the Ammonites. And he comes home and his daughter comes out to meet him. She's dancing. She's singing. This is his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low and you've become the cause of great trouble to me. For I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. I don't know what Jephthah's relationship was with the Torah, but he clearly didn't read about the sacrifice where you could take back your vow. Where he could have atoned for his own sin, his bad sacrifice. And you got to love her. The faith of a daughter that says, my father, you did. You told Yahweh to do something and, and you should do to me what you said you were going to do. And so she takes two months, there's a time of mourning, and then he kills her in the name of the Lord. And that's disgusting. That's not a good thing. And, that, and you know it's not a good thing because the text doesn't paint it in a positive light. And so here's where a text like chapter 11 is easier for me. I can say, God does not like it when you sacrifice your daughters as a burnt offering. That's a bad thing to do. Don't do that. You don't gain bonus points with the Lord. I also get to say this, that the cross of Christ is more powerful than a burnt offering of a daughter. And there's some things in your life that you have offered up that are sinful and horrible and terrible, and the cross of Christ covers those. That today, you can look back on your life, and if you're sitting in shame and guilt, you can know that when Jesus was put on the cross, that is the only son that has ever been sacrificed that means more to us than anything else. When Jesus hung on the cross, every single sin is paid for, including this one right here. And there's a part of me that says, that's not fair. I don't like that. And to that, I just say, not yet, I don't. But I wonder if there's a pothole in my life somewhere in the future where I choose to walk my way and not God's way. And when I stand before him one day, I won't be standing there saying, Lord, I messed up, now I'm out. I'll be saying, your cross is everything. The gospel was everything. I can call men and women in Tucson to reject the most heinous of sins because of the cross. 
I don't have to harmonize their sins. I don't have to make excuses for their sins. I can say it's sin. Receive forgiveness and walk towards Jesus. Know your Savior. Here's how I'd like us to end. One, let us end with a sense of weight about our own culture. Our culture is a giant conglomerate of ideas. Some of them are good. Most people don't know why they're good. If you were to ask people, how did we get these good ideas? They'd say, I don't know. Bob said it. It's like, okay. Well, they come from somewhere. And you can trace those things historically. I highly encourage you, pick up a good Christian history book. Know where you come from. Know where good ideas come from. If you think it's a good idea, you should be able to trace it to why it's a good idea. It can't be because it's popular, church. Abortion was really popular. It is incredibly popular. It doesn't make it moral. Sexual ethics can be incredibly popular, but they are immoral. Morality, goodness, holiness has nothing to do with popularity. It has nothing to do with what year it is. We have to be able to trace these things back to God's word. If God isn't moving us forward, instructing us in righteousness, then we are being instructed in wickedness. I saw a quote this week that I thought was so good. Um, I want to say it was from Spurgeon. He said the difference between discernment is not good, not the difference between good and evil, but the difference between right and almost right. That discernment is not the difference between good and evil, but it's the difference between right and almost right. That's a heavy burden for you to bear because you live in a culture that is constantly throwing things at you that you have to process and trace. The Christian church has to slow down and reevaluate what is actually true so we don't end up worshiping in a way that will sacrifice something we cannot get back. Let's not sacrifice our sons and daughters on bad theology. Don't sacrifice your marriages on bad theology. Don't sacrifice worship on bad theology. Know God's word. The second is this, if you are walking in sin and, and you got to this morning and you debated not even taking the Lord's Supper because you thought, man, am I even allowed to take this? I feel like I would be taken in vain. No, there's a call always in the gospel to repent that if we ask Jesus for forgiveness, he is quick to forgive us. And we can do that right now as a church. We can go to the Father and you can ask him for forgiveness and you will receive it. Once you receive it, don't continue in sin so that, may, so that grace may abound. That's what Paul teaches us in Romans. But rather, press onward and upward to the next right thing. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this chapter. If not for the simple reason, Lord, I can look at Jephthah and know that there is hope for any sinner. That we can know you and we can totally mess up. And yet you are holy and you are good. God, I pray that this morning you would just convict us about the world around us. There's so many men that I've listened to, Lord, that are just, they're, they're compelling. They're really cool. They, they inspire me to go do interesting things. And, and Lord, they're not Christians. And so for those guys, would you save them? Because they would be so much cooler if they were Christians. And Lord, for those who are just outwardly uh, reviling your name, that it's not something that's hidden or stuck in the corruption of their hearts, but it's just open rebellion, Lord, would you put it down? Put it down through their salvation by saving them through your gospel. Put it down through your means, Lord, but use your church to proclaim the gospel in such a way that we would not let evil stand God, I pray that you would empower us to repentance. Lord, this morning, would you forgive me of my sins? Help me to walk according to the cross of Christ, that I am saved by his cross, and I am called to carry mine. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.